many of you know that we serve the risen King this morning? Seated on His throne right now, looking down on us. Soon, I believe, to come back and get us if we're ready. And if we're not, those who are ready will get called up in the glory. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, verse number 15. Matthew 7, verse 15. I want to remind you of our 11 o'clock service. We will be having a mission service, missional service, I guess you would say. Uh, we have a very, uh, very special presentation just before we start service. Um, I want you to be here for uh, Aiden will be reciting his books of the Bible at the 11 o'clock service. So come and support Aiden. I know that he'll be excited for that for you to be here but I'm looking forward to what God is doing and how God is moving I just want to share with you a little bit of discipleship this morning Matthew chapter 7 verse number 15 if you have it say amen amen beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are raging wolves I want to ask if you would, would you just stretch your hand this way this morning and ask God's anointing over the Word. Father God, Lord, I come before you once again this morning, Father, and I ask you, Lord, that you would touch and move in a mighty way, God. God, we praise you, Father, for all that you've done. Lord, all that you're doing, God, we ask you, Lord, that you would just minister in this place this morning, God, touching hearts and lives. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would pour out, God. God, let someone here, Lord, be changed, God. God, we pray, Father, that you would just minister through us, Lord, using us, God, God, and anointing us. Father, we'll give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for it all. In Jesus' wonderful name, we ask it, believe it, and receive it. Amen. You may be seated this morning. I want to read to you that verse one more time before I get started. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. So inwardly means who they really are. Uh, they, they say that they're one thing, but they're really another. They turn out to be something else. There's a danger in aligning yourself with someone who is not who they say they are. Is that okay? That's something that we teach our children from the time that they're old enough to walk and they start school. We start telling them, be careful who you hang out with. I remember uh, a little saying, you hang around trash long enough, you'll begin to stink too. Yeah, y'all ever heard that? Uh, a sheep, uh, excuse me, birds of a feather flock together. We've heard all these kind of things, but yet there's a point in our life as a Christian that we begin to think that it is okay to do whatever we want to do as long as it's in the name of God. I can hang out with who I want to hang out. I can do with what I want to do because I'm a child of God. Jesus did it, so therefore He set the example. I can do it too. I've come to tell you this morning that you better be careful who you hang out with. You better watch out who you associate yourself with and be careful because you know what? Even though Jesus did it, doesn't mean that you're Jesus. Amen? He set the example of how we should do and what we should do, but He didn't tell us that all things He did that we should do also. Uh, if we look at Jesus' life, we know that Jesus was without fault. He had no sin. Jesus was perfect, right? Right? And therefore, if any of us can say the same thing, then that would make us equal with Jesus. You're perfect this morning. I want you to come up here. We want to give you a round of applause. Praise God. None are like Jesus. Amen? So we understand that there is a danger in aligning yourself with people who, especially people who say they're one thing and are not those things. If we're not careful, whenever we begin to, to associate, not just going and having supper with a sinner from time to time, I'm talking about whenever you link yourself with somebody who pretends to be one thing and is really another thing, it is just a matter of time before it can begin to wear off on you and you become something different as well. We're talking about sheep this morning. We're talking about prophets who pretend to be a prophet but are really a, a tool of the devil. Y'all know that existed? People who stand behind a pulpit and preach the gospel and claim to be one thing, but yet they live a lie of the devil and are something completely different. 
That exists. But you've got to have a discernment of the Spirit to know the difference. Whenever you just hang out with whoever and whatever and you don't care because of a name associated with them, if you're not careful, you'll find out real quick that, you know what, I am in deep now and I can't get out. I don't know what to do. Because they overtake your thoughts and your mind. Jesus said, watch out for these people because they're really something far different than who they appear to be. Understand that sheep are harmless. They don't prey on other animals. They eat grass and not meat. A wolf, on the other hand, is something that kills and eats whatever it can, whenever it can. The wolf is obviously something that is very dangerous. You can be injured quickly if you hang around people who appear to be one thing but turn out to be different. Jesus told us that some people who appear to be very religious, watch out for them, they look like they're one of the sheep, they dress the part, they look the part, they even may sound like sheep. But given the opportunity they're, of who they really are, they will be revealed to you and you may not like what you see. Mark chapter 12 and 38 says, He also said in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who want to go around in long robes, who want greetings in the marketplaces, the front seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at banquets. What Mark's talking about right here, what's going on in Mark chapter 12, is he was saying, watch out for people who go around beating their chest, so to speak, saying, hey, I am somebody in this religious world. And look at me, look at what I have done. Y'all ever seen anybody like that? And we see it happen and we see it take place and sometimes we even fall into the traps. Wow, this person said this and this person said that. They're amazing. They're, they're such a, a child of God. They're just all there. But unless you have begun to pray and seek God for discernment of the Spirit, if you're not careful, you'll, you'll completely lose every bit of knowledge that you ever had because you'll begin to believe a lie of the devil and be damned to hell. Is it their fault that you went to hell? If you haven't been praying and seeking God, don't put your salvation in somebody else's hands. Know it for yourself. That's why we have to continually seek and study. Follow up on what I'm telling you or anybody else who stands in this pulpit tells you and make sure what they're saying is of God. If there's no meat from the Word of God and they get up here and they exhort you and they spout scriptures that they say it so quick, you're not sure what they said, be careful of anybody who stands. I'm not just talking about this pulpit and this podium. I'm talking about anybody who you listen to that claims to be a man or a woman of God. Back it up. Check it. Make sure it's fact. Heard somebody just say yesterday, they was listening to a thing and said that Revelations was all wrong. Careful what you hear and what you let go into your ears. If you'll listen to that mess, why don't you listen to the rest of the Bible and get saved and sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and turn your life around and not be a sinner anymore. When you read the Gospels, you'll find a common thread with Jesus. He does not like people who say they're one thing, but they're actually somebody else. He don't like that. That makes him mad. That gets him upset. He begins to, to sometimes get a little bit of a, of a rampage himself. And he'll even walk up into the church house and flip over a few tables and get a whip and drive everybody out because it makes him mad. He don't like people like that. When you read the Gospels, we see that. He, he don't like people who say they're one thing, but they're actually something else. Jesus didn't like people who put on a facade. Actually, in my notes, I said he put on a mask. They, they put on a mask. I thought, ooh, I, that's not the best word for that there. Jesus don't like people who tries to pretend to be something to cover up who they really are. He wants some genuine people who say that I am what I say I am. I'm going to serve God the same way at home in my closet as I'll serve God in a church house. God wants people who's going to serve Him with all they've got, not people who get dressed up, fancied up, come sit on the front row of the church and begin to say, oh, but I'm a child of God and get the attention of the people. God wants people who are going to serve Him wholeheartedly with everything that they have. And here's why. 
Because people who wear a fake facade create confusion in the church. And God is not the author of confusion. Therefore, if we're coming into the church and saying one thing inside the church and living another way outside of the church, it creates confusion and chaos. And people begin to go on these places where they're not sure. You know what? Oh, so-and-so said this. And I'm seeing this from a lot of pastors. And, and oh, so-and-so did this. But, but you know what? The, the church people are doing that. I'm confused and don't know what to do. I think I'll go back to my old ways. It's not Jesus' plan at all. He came to bring understanding to us. They misrepresent to the world who Jesus is and what living for Him is really all about. This confusion causes chaos. It causes people who need salvation to be turned away from the church because they find that there's something worse than their own situation. That's hypocrisy. Jesus told a parable one day. He said in Luke chapter 6 verse 41. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye. But don't notice the log in your own. Or how can you say to your brother. Brother let me take out the speck that is in your eye. Whenever you yourself don't see the log in your own eye. Hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Y'all ever been a part of that? Ever been a part of the one that had the log in your eye? Amen, I have. I have. There's been times in my life whenever I've seen somebody else's problem and I overlooked my own. We've done that before, if we're honest. We begin to say, you know what, what they need is this. And what I need is none of nobody else's business because it's between me and God. Right? And that's the mindset that we have. But the truth of it is is that we need to recognize and realize our own problems and say, God, I've got faults. And Lord, I need you to fix me, God, so that I can be better used. Lord, I need God. I need you more than ever before to take care of the problems in my life so that I can help others. So that I can help others. But sometimes... Sometimes we need to first realize that I can't help them if I can't help myself. I can't help myself. I need God. So wouldn't it be better if instead of I tried to help with their situation and figure out all their problems, first I let God take care of all of mine, and then in the process I share with them what worked for me. We need more of God. We need to grow and understand and be discipled and trained so that we can go into the rest of the world. The uttermost parts of the world is what one, one version says. Go into the uttermost and see that, that they're discipled and trained as well. That we take the gospel here and we learn it the best we can and then we go and we take it to them so that they might be saved also. Jesus is saying, quit pretending to be something that you're not. It's better to be real. And it's better to be honest. Nobody likes a fake. There's something about a fake that you can hear it in their voice. You can see it in their eyes. You know that what they're saying is fake. Talked about it a lot. But you know whenever somebody tells you, I love you, you just ugh, cringe. I refuse to say it back if I didn't feel it. Even if I love them back, I ain't saying it. I'm going to hold on to it. Yep, good deal. Fist bump. Shake a hand. Nod ahead. I am not saying it back. Forget it. Because you felt that it was fake, right? There's something about whenever someone tells you that they love you and you know that it's fake, it sort of, sort of hurts your feelings. Breaks your heart. Why, why did you just lie to me? I can tell. I love how you can see a child's heart through their eyes. 
Sometimes it breaks your heart, especially as a pastor. One service, everything's great, and you can see it all. They're just happy. They love you. The next service, mom and dad's looking down at the floor, and their kid won't look you in the eyes. I always giggle. <laughs> yep. I knew who was the conversation at supper last night. Seriously. You can see that a child loves you in their eyes. There's no lying, no doubting. You, you, can't, you can't run from it. You can tell how they feel when you begin to talk to them. And if they say, I love you, you can see all the way to their heart. and You know that they love you. But adults, we have begun to get really good at masking it. We've had years of practice to make it perfected. So that we can pretend one way. And that's a lot of times sad how the church will do. And I'm not talking about our church because obviously, look around, we've got the greatest that there is. But on the other hand, there's lots of Christian people who have mastered the fact of pretending to be one way and living the other way. And through pretending to be one way and live the other way, or living one way and pretending to be the other way, either way you look at it, what they have done is they have mastered fakeness. They have mastered putting on a facade and a fake so that they can fool you into believing that there's something. But through your faith in God and seeking discernment of the Spirit, you can learn to override their fakeness. That's scary, ain't it? Especially if you've ever been fake before. Because that means that somebody who is praying and seeking God enough will begin to have the power To override your fakeness and they'll begin to see through you. Wow. That's that's powerful. Let's be honest. If we're really serving God for the real reasons, we're going to have power. And God is going to give us discernment. God is going to teach us these things, but we have to want to get deeper. Not God, I need a miracle, and I came this morning, I felt some chill bumps and goose pimples, and it was great, and, and God touched and moved on the situation I had, and, and I'm going to go home and, and just, you know, watch, touched by an angel, and man, that's going to be my devotion for the week. Praise the Lord. That's a lot of people's mindset. We have to get deeper in the Word. Seek. God tells us that we should test spirits. I believe that discernment is a spirit of God that you can receive once you've been filled with the Holy Ghost and saved and right with Him, living right. It's hard to receive the spirit of discernment if you're not living right. Amen. We hear Jesus over and over telling the people to judge not one another. He knew that if the people in the church were to judge one another, that the person being judged may start acting like nothing was wrong in order to keep other people from judging them. If we act like nothing is wrong, we'll never get healed. You with me? So, so basically... Sometimes you have to come humble before God and before everyone around you in order to come to a place to where you can fall on your knees and ask God to heal you. But there's no reason for God to heal you if you have put on fake and and just painted yourself up to look one way, pretending as if that nothing is wrong, and I'm going to come into the house of God And I'm just going to worship like everything is perfect and everything is fine. And if someone says, how are you doing? I'm going to say, oh man, I am just wonderful today. Praise God. Yes. Yes. It's good. But on the inside, you're dying and breaking to pieces. You know who really is going to be praying for you that God would take care of the mess going on on the inside? Absolutely nobody. Because you're a fake. We need to bring who we really are through the doors. 
bring that person in and let God begin to move and transform and to make us who He really wants us to be. We're going to have to be willing to say that I'm going to open up and I'm going to lay it all out on the line. And if somebody takes my private stuff, Brother Randy, and they begin to share it with the rest of the world, shame on them. They'll be the ones that has to be judged for what they've done wrong. But I'm not worried about what the rest of the world thinks, you see, because I'm only focused on what God thinks. So therefore, I'm going to be as real as I possibly can be. I'm going to bring myself into the house of God. I'm going to trust God to meet the need. I'm going to trust God to take care of the problem. I'm going to look to Him and only Him for the things that I have need of. I'm going to believe that God is able and I'm not going to put on a fake and a facade and bring something to Him that isn't real. We've got to be willing to bring it all to Him, the real stuff. Bring us Ourself to an altar. Give me one second. At some point, it's time to quit being fake. You've got to realize that you got to take off the suit and tie and show people who Jesus really is in your life not covered up by something that looks good. When I read the scriptures, I find God using some pretty rough individuals. Some of them were liars, thieves. Some were drunks, adulterers, murderers. One man who God used to write most of the New Testament, he had actually been a murderer, a traitor of Christian men, women, and children. Man, he had stirred up a lot of junk. But then God used him to write most of the New Testament. Isn't that amazing? God radically changed who he was. And he was never a fake. He was either a sinner, very proud of his sin, or he became a Christian and he said, I'm not going to be who I used to be. He didn't just become a secret service Christian who hid and ducked their head and said, you know what, I'm going to pray in a closet somewhere where nobody knows that I'm praying and I'm not going to use the name of Jesus. I'm just going to say you and I'm not going to talk about the blood that's been applied to my life. I'm going to talk about that stuff that runs over me and and I'm going to leave it all like that. People really won't know what I'm saying. Is that not almost the, the same as blasphemy or denying God? And We've got to be willing to do it with all, all that we've got. And if it makes somebody mad that we serve God, they don't need to be in our life anyway. Quit aligning ourselves with people who are going to tear down the name of God that we worship and we serve. Get away from them. You know what? You can only do it so many times before you're just casting your pearl before swine. That's the truth of it. In the day that Saul had come to know God... That was where he took off a facade of religious pity. God said, now I can use him. See, at some point we've got to take off what we're hiding Jesus behind. Maybe it's not a suit and tie for you, but maybe it's your pride or your pain, your prosperity, your education. At some point it's time to take off the mask that hides you. Let the Holy Spirit heal you and clean you up so that you can show your family and your neighbors who Jesus really is. I want to be real. That's what we're about here at Real Life. Real people serving a real God. I I want to be as honest as I can possibly be and let God use me. I realized that sometimes, being honest, I was talking to a lady yesterday and she said that she had reached the age to where she could say what she was thinking. And I said, is, is there really ever a point where you can do that and it not hurt people's feelings though? She said, 
eh, I waited a long time to get here. I'm good with it. Okay. I want you to think about that a minute. To reach an age to where you can say what's on your mind and it not matter. To reach the point where you could be discipling people at a, at a rate that is just through the roof, but you choose to hurt people's feelings and tear people down because you speak the truth. There's nothing wrong at all with speaking the truth. Amen? Amen. So, so we know that speaking the truth is actually better than speaking a lie, but sometimes you just need to keep your mouth shut. Sometimes you just need to leave it alone so that you ain't tearing someone down rather than building them up because to tear someone down and destroy them sometimes is causing confusion and chaos because you're walking around beating your chest saying, I'm a Christian and a child of God. So what good did you just do whenever you told that person that, you know what, you're nothing and if you don't quit and act like this and you just don't do this and and begin to tell all of your thoughts and everything running through your head... Sometimes I believe that it's a thought because Jesus wanted it to stay in your head and not out your mouth. He didn't tell us that we had to share all of our thoughts. Amen? We want this church to be approachable. That's why we're real people serving a real God. Having a real life and a real walk with Him. But the moment that the rest of the world begins to be holier than thou, no longer is it real. It becomes fake. and It becomes a facade that they put on to try and cover up and hide things. They are no longer accessible to anybody who would walk through the doors. All of a sudden, they became different. I'm not one of the in crowd that's in the four walls. I'm a part of the world, and whenever I walked in the church, they let me know. They looked me up and down with their eyeballs. They walked away, shaking their head, because I wasn't dressed the part or didn't look how I should look to be in their church. Praise God. We're not that church. But I pray that God would let us not be that church outside of the church either. That God would use us to reach out to a lost and dying world and show them love in Jesus and who Jesus is. Jesus mentioned the scribes in their long clothing. They loved to dress up and put on an image of religion. They thought what they wore made them holy. They thought how they looked told people who they were. Inwardly, Jesus said, they devour a widow's houses. But outwardly, they pretend... They pretended to represent the kingdom of God. That's what I love about Jesus. I don't have to put on a mask in order to be loved by him. I can be myself, and he loves me just as I am. I don't have to worry about how I come to him. You know, um, I believe that the way that a lot of mothers take their kids to school in the car rider line, Jesus loves them that way just as much as he does the way that they dress up to go to work. In other words, he'll love us without the makeup and without our hair done just as much as he will, the same way that we look whenever we roll out of the bed in the morning. And and, and he'll love us the same way if we are fixed up. He loves us for who's on the inside. He doesn't care about what we look like or the way that we dress, the way that we... He does care about the way that we act and the way that we talk, though. But he wants us to be real. Sometimes we've got to let Jesus change who we are. See, because who we are is, is sometimes a mess. Sometimes who we are is a, is a jacked up mess so bad that, you know what, we don't want to be used by God in that situation anymore. We want to be changed. So if we look at Paul, Paul was a jacked up mess, and Paul, who he was, as Saul, he, he couldn't be used in that state, but God changed him, and immediately he transformed, and he knew that no longer would I be the old man, but now I'm going to be the new man. No longer will I be the person I used to be, but now I'm going to be a new person in Christ Jesus. He went from one extreme to the other extreme. The Word of God says those that praise much, have been forgiven of much, in a sense. Is that right? 
And, and so we see that, you know what, sometimes it takes a radical change in people's life, but sometimes people haven't really been through a lot. I haven't really been through a lot. I look at my life and say, man, I have really made some mistakes and I've been through a lot, but the truth of it is is that, Brother Randy, yeah, I've been in church my whole entire life. I... I while I was growing up, I think the only time I ever missed church was, was, uh, oh, can't think of any. What, what about when you're sick, Pastor? Hadn't really been sick, but a few times in my life. But even whenever I was sick, uh, my mom and daddy believed in that little bit of scripture. It said, whenever there's one sick among you, bring them to the, the elders of the church and lay hands on them, anoint them, pray for them, that sick be saved. They wasn't skipping for nothing. So therefore, there's a lot of things in life that I knew how to get out of. I knew that prayer worked. I knew that God could change a lot of things. So I can't say that I've been in the place of a lot of other people. But I realize, Nolan, I'm not who I used to be. That God has made me somebody different. And it is time that we go with all that we've got and say, I'm not going to pretend to be something that I'm not. I'm going to let God change me. And God can change me on a daily basis. I'm going to become who He wants me to be. That's what I love about Jesus. That's why I love Him. You don't have to be somebody or act different than you are to be accepted by Him. You don't have to put on a facade. You just have to be real, be honest. See, if we're not real, we'll never reach people with the love of Jesus. Because they'll see through it. You can't wear pride and show people Jesus. You have to, you have to love them being a humble person with a humble heart realizing that Jesus was a servant so what makes you any different God is looking for people who will be real not be proud have their pride too big say something else too you can't you can't put on a facade that looks like Jesus and pretends to represent him if you really don't love him and and want to be like him. I'll tell you why, because people's needs are too great. A false image of God can't heal the brokenhearted. People don't really get saved under the power of a false prophet. They never change. Healing don't take place under the power of a false prophet. You've got to have God in your life to receive it, give it. I've realized that I have won more people to God than living for God than if I wasn't living for God. The truth of it is that I've never won a single person to God while I lived in the world. While I didn't give it all to God, there wasn't one person that came to know God under anything that I had to say. But the only way that we'll ever see anybody come to God is because we have lived God in front of them. The greatest testimony you'll ever have is the way you live your life on a day-to-day basis. It isn't the the story that you told in a church service or the one thing that that set you apart and made you different. It is the way that you live day in and day out that makes you somebody. And if you've decided that this is who I am and you've accepted a certain thing in your life and you've said this is is the way it will always be, and that's why I am the way that I am and that's why I am who I am, it doesn't represent God. You won't see people come to know God. God has called us to be disciples. If God has called us to share the gospel, how in the world are we going to do it if we want to continue to be who we was while we was in the world? It's important to be real. It's okay to be common. It's okay to be authentic. It's 
okay to take off the mask. It's okay to be someone who people can relate to. Because if they can't relate to us, how will they hear us when we tell them about our God? I know today that you've got loved ones who you would really love to introduce them to Jesus. But you struggle with it. I know that because it's common. I'm in the same place. There's some that I would love to tell about Jesus, but part of them are stuck in the past. Some don't want to hear it. Some, if we're honest, we've been too scared to share it. But I know today that there are people that need it. People in our family that need, need God. You would love to see them come to church. It hasn't happened yet. People around us need to feel what we've experienced. When we come together on a Sunday morning like this and, and, and we're with one another and we're just sharing before church, God, God blesses and moves and, and the, the family atmosphere we have. There's, there's people who need that. They need to be loved by somebody. Everybody has a family, but whether or not their family is a family or not is a different story. Church is a place to where we can come and, and love one another and be real with one another and overlook the faults in one another and realize that I can't do anything about the fault of my brother and my sister except for pray for them and love them anyway because we're a family. And so therefore, if we're a family... That means that we've got to be willing to share with one another. You'll never get prayer for the thing that you struggle the most with if you don't share it with someone. As long as you keep it hid and you pretend like it's not there, nobody will ever know. They'll never pray for it. I know that you don't have to share everything in life. But if you can't handle it on your own, maybe it's time to give it to God. What better than to share it with two or three who will also take it to God? The Word of God tells us where two or three gather. I've thought about the having one mind in one accord and how if, if we've all thinking the same thoughts and we're together, there was this place where the, the people all came together and they decided to build a tower to get to heaven. God looked down and said, Ah, and they put their mind together, agreeing with one another. They can do anything. I'll scatter them, confuse their language, and send them to different parts of the earth. He named that place Babylon, and he babbled them. I realize that if we come together, we can really do something. God made us that way. I want to reach heaven. I want my family to be saved. I wonder if this morning you would consider spending a little time this week with somebody that you know, love, Invite them to be your guest here next week. I've done what I thought possible. I, I've tried to motivate. I've tried to do a lot of things. But I realize that sometimes, you know what? We can, we can put an excuse on anything. We're scared. Oh, we've asked everybody we know. Have you? Invite your family. Spend a little time with them, though. Because if you don't spend time with them and you just send out texts, what I also realize is it's just a text. They're just doing something. Uh, you know what, they, yeah, I've been invited to church plenty of times. I'm not coming this week neither. But it's, 
when you spend time with them, they begin to see your heart. And if they can see your heart, and then you invite them, it's not just about inviting them to church. If they say, well, I don't want to go to that church. Where would you go to church this Sunday at? Pastor, are you saying that I could go to another church? Absolutely. If somebody will get saved, go to that church, that other church, pray about it. Pray that God would lead the man of God to speak life into that person, that, that, that he, would, he would speak over them through his message or something that he says, that they would come to an altar and give their heart and their life to Christ. Repent of their sin that they might be saved. It is not about just building real life community church. It's about building the church of God, the kingdom of God. That's what it's about. God's church. Invite them to go to church. And if they give you an excuse, do away with it. Go to where they want to go. And wouldn't it be a shame to get to heaven? I've heard John say this a hundred times. I've heard others. I've, I've seen it. We shared it this past week. The only thing that you can take to heaven sitting around you. People. We work so hard for things that we're going to leave behind. We work so little for the things that we can take with us. Show somebody. Christ that lives within you so that you might be able to share the good news and the gospel with them that they might be saved and make it to heaven we've got to take off whatever separates us the ones that we love we've got to be real with them let them know that I'm not condemning you to hell for the sin that I know that you're a part of I've had problems myself. The Lord was able to handle them. Share with them. Let's show them that we love them. Let's show them we care about them. Let's show them Jesus. If we can show them Jesus, something might change. We, we have set up everything that we possibly can in order to have that special moment. Over the next six weeks, we've got six special service Sundays. We're not having guest speakers at all of them, but we're doing something special. Uh, this, this Sunday morning, we're having our mission service. We're going to, anybody who wants to bring canned foods or anything like that, we'll be donating these things to the, as far as a local level of missions. We're going to take up an offering uh, for a, a YWEA project in, a, in, in missions that's overseas. We're going to do that. Uh, we're going we're gonna to share about what, what God has done so far in these places, but we're going to preach the word. Every week we're going to do this. There's going to be something special, a special opportunity for you to invite somebody so that you might see your family get saved. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But the first thing we have to do starts today with us. We have to take off the mask. Not the one that the store requires you to wear. You got to take off the mask that I'm pretending to be something that I'm not. Just because God has saved you, He hasn't made you so holy that you can't talk to a sinner. Come on. Didn't do Him that way. As a matter of fact, Jesus went and hung out with them, went and ate supper with them, but whenever He left, his positive influence changed them. I think about a particular tax collector. He wanted to see Jesus very bad. He just wanted to see who he was. Whenever he saw him, Jesus called him out, told him, come on down. He, he stretched out. He went out as far as he possibly could. He stuck his neck out, so to speak, climbed out on a limb so that he could see Jesus. And Jesus called him out said, come on, I want to go to your house today. He went to his house, and, and people was mad. They was upset. They wondered why in the world Jesus was going to eat with this sinner, eat with this man. But he went, and he ate with him, and whenever it was all said and done, he turned around, and he blessed anybody who he had ever done wrong. He gave them more than he had took, and he'd done right by what he was supposed to do. Jesus made an influence on his life. 
You can make an influence. You can make an impact on other people's life through your influence and how that you live the Word of God before them. Some people, the only Bible they'll ever read is you. So seek God that God would have you to share with them what you need to share. I want to ask if you would stand this morning. I want to pray for you that God would help you to take off anything that would separate you from Him that others might see Him in you. If there's anything that you need loose of this morning, I believe that we've got such a great church that they'll come get behind you and they'll pray and seek God with you. That God would move on you in such a way that the old could be removed, cast away, that the new could shine. Father God, we come before you this morning, Lord, and we ask you that you would touch and move in a mighty way on each and every life that's here, God. God, I pray that you would just flow through us, Lord, touching our lives, God. God, that we would be a representation that you would be proud of, God. God, that we wouldn't be one that is slack concerning your will, Father, but we would do whatever it takes, God, to show the world you inside of us. God, I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be ashamed of the gospel that we wouldn't be ashamed of you, Father, because you have said if we're ashamed of you here, you'll be ashamed of us whenever we make it to heaven. Father, I don't want to hear you say, depart from me. But Lord, I want to I want to see you look at me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Father, I want to share you with my family. I want to share you with my friends. I want to share you, God, with people that I come in contact with. Lord, I praise you for that, God. God, I know, Lord, that you've put this on my life, God. You've put a calling on my life to talk to others, God. God, to disciple them, Lord, to share with them the good news and how God has been so great to me. I know that you've given me that, God. God, and I pray, Father, that you would help me, Lord, relay the message to everyone that I can, God. God, that we would be your disciple. Father, I praise you, Lord. And I pray that you would touch your people, God. Let us be used by you, Father. Jesus name I give you the praise the glory and the honor for it all in your name I pray amen we want to pray before we dismiss the Sunday school as well let's pray that God would just touch our teachers that God would touch all of us that are sitting listening that God would just anoint our ears to understand the word God has laid discipleship on my heart so heavy this year I believe that we need to learn as much as we possibly can. I've heard a story of a lady that was in a Bible study, and as she was in this Bible study in China, they only had very few pieces of Bibles, and they was reading from it. This one lady gave hers to someone else who didn't have one, and as he began to read, as the instructor, he began to read, he noticed that this lady, she quoted every single word. Afterwards, he went to her, and he said, I noticed that you... You knew every word that we read. You quoted it right along with me. She said, I have hidden the word in my heart. That it wouldn't be took from me. I believe that our country is not headed in a direction that it needs to head. Christians are being persecuted. Only the strong be martyred for his word. The weak will turn their back on God. But I want to know that if they take away my Bible, it's all right. Because I've hidden his words in my heart. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I pray that you would learn in Sunday school and that it would be more than just filler between services. Be more than about a biscuit or a donut and a cup of coffee, that it would be about learning, becoming closer to God. Amen? Amen.